Psalm chapter number, Psalm chapter 62, the 62nd Psalm. Uh, this would actually be the 70th sermon out of the book of Psalms. And uh, I say that to say this, there is a, it is easy for, for me to fall into the same rhythm with each and every one of these Psalms to where they get repetitive. And I don't want to do that, so uh, indulge me as I try to approach each one at an angle that maybe you don't see coming. I trust it's biblical, obviously. I'm not trying to abuse any scripture or take things out of context, but uh, to approach it biblically, but make some application that we may not see. In the 62nd Psalm here, we see just a few things in the superscription. It's a Psalm of David. He gives it to the chief musician, to Judithan. And uh, so that's all we know. No background. We're going to read of some trials and tribulations that are going on in David's life. Uh, but more importantly, what we read about in this psalm is that David learns to rely on the Lord and he turns to the Lord. And uh, I've preached many psalms about that very subject, so hopefully if you'll stick with me to the end, you'll see uh, some blessings I have, or that the Lord has for us. Hopefully he can help me with. If you would please stand in honor of God's word. We're going to read the whole psalm. <coughs> and hopefully in a timely manner I get through this. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From Him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief? This is Him speaking to whoever is causing Him issues. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall be ye, and as a tottering fence both unstable, and if you see a tottering fence or a bowling wall, the, the initial thought is this, that's coming down pretty soon. Yeah. And David says, that's how I'm looking at anybody that's going to make things up about me and come against me, God's anointed. I'm, I can see it's coming. You're coming down. Probably similar to when, how he felt about Goliath as he walked out into that meadow that day. Anyways. They only consult uh, to cast him down from his excellency. I believe David would have been king at this time because to cast him down from his excellency, he's got to be up there. And I don't, he's not talking about God. They're not talking about God here. They delight in lies. We already know that he uses imagination. And by the way, I'm kind of talking through this song because we're not going to spend a lot of time breaking it down. So hopefully we can get some application. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Jerks. I'd rather you just be a jerk to me all the time. Don't smile and say nice yeah. things to my face and then talk bad about me to everybody behind my back or inward. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 5, My soul wait thou only upon God. Here's where he shifts back and now he's almost, it's almost like he's telling himself how he already felt. He's reminding himself how he felt. Does that make sense? Yeah. For my expectation is from him. It's a good place to have expectations. He knows my expectations in myself are, well, I'm a loser. <laughs> I mess up. I'm a sinner. Saved by grace, but my expectations are from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Kind of re repeating verse 2 there, similar at least. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Here's where you need to be encouraging anybody that's going to read or hear this. Trust in Him, with all, or trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. If it works for me, it works for you. You should give it a shot. That's what he's saying. Surely, men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether, which meaning that word altogether means they're the same, lighter than vanity. Verse number 10, Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth to God. And that word power just means strength, belongs to God. Similar, I mean, it's, power is the accurate word. I'm not correcting it, of course, just trying to give insight. Verse number 12, Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. For thou renderest to every man according to his work. I almost keened in on verse 12, but I thought, you know, we talked about judgment Sunday afternoon, we're going to find a new avenue. And so let's see what the Lord has for us this evening. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you'd help us uh, with this passage, Lord, to, to 
get through it in a quick enough way that we can get to the insight I think that you have for us that you led me to. And so, Lord, look forward to the message. Uh, be with me as I preach. Be with my voice, my uh, Lord, sinus passages, everything. Just help everything to stay in check through this. Uh, Lord, empty me of self and the Holy Spirit. Help me to proclaim your word in a timely manner. Uh, Lord, bless the time uh, in your word and ask that you'd help us to take the application and put it uh, to practice in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. <coughs> All right, we're titled tonight. You ready? Here's the title. Shh. If you're a note taker, I don't know how you're going to write that one down. I actually put HH or SH and a bunch of U's. That's not how you would spell it. I know. Hey, it's a, it's a sound. You can make the sound however you want to make the sound. It's your sound. You just, however you write it down, there's no right or wrong. But it will show up on YouTube as SH, U, 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 U. Shoo. <laughs> silence. We are a society that hates quiet and silence. We fear it so much, we have learned to fill every waking moment and some sleeping moments with noise. The average American, and maybe this isn't you, and if it's not you, great, but the average American, the moment they wake up in the morning, they start the news, they start a podcast, they start music on their phone, whatever it may be, as they get ready for work and as they eat breakfast or drink their coffee or whatever it may be, and if it's not those things, they have <coughs> other noises going on, then they get in their car, with which they connect to Apple CarPlay or Google CarPlay or whatever, or whatever car thing they have in their phone, their Bluetooth to their, and they're listening to a podcast or they're listening to music and they get to the... They get to the office, and then at the office, of course, you got the normal noise of work. But on top of that, in a lot of office places, there's a radio playing somewhere. There's natural uh, music that maybe even the office itself puts or whatever, wherever you work. I know my dad, uh, my dad knew the soundtrack to Albertsons and the different songs Albertsons played very well because he heard them over and 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 all. And so always something in the background, you say, well, that's great. I mean, that's not a big deal. Then they take a lunch, and while they're at lunch, now they entertain themselves with their own noise, watching YouTube videos or scrolling through social media and short after short or TikTok after TikTok or videos on Instagram or whatever it may be, and they spend their entire lunch hour or lunch 30 minutes or whatever it is doing that, and then they go back to work where there's more noise, and then they leave work, and they get back in the car, and there's music, and there's Apple CarPlay, and there's podcasts, or there's whatever there is while they're doing that. And then they get home, and then there's the TV on, and there's uh, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or television shows or movies and more noise, and then they're watching TV before they go to bed, or they're playing on their phone before they go to bed, and, and they go to sleep with the TV on, or they go to sleep with the, the, the cell phone on, you say, that's weird, no, that's normal now, that's very normal, that's why most TVs have a sleep function, because... What they want to do is set that thing for two hours or an hour, an hour and a half, whatever it may be, and then they go to sleep with the noise on, and then uh, most of them go to sleep and having noise, and then still while they're sleeping, there's noise. It's becoming even more prevalent in the past few decades where now teenagers today, and I, I, I got to see it in person even as I was around my own niece and nephew, are just constant with, with noise. Headphones on all the time. Cell phone all the time, just all the time, all the time, all the time. So, well, Pastor, is that a big deal? Yes, because of this. The reason it's important is if we fill our lives with noise, what we rob ourselves of is what David did in this psalm, which is this, silently waiting on God. In many circumstances of life, sometimes good circumstances and especially the bad ones, we can usually only do one of two things. Quietly, patiently wait on the Lord or stress, be anxious, be fearful, uh, be upset, be scared, whatever the emotion, other emotion is. And uh, here in our passage, David does choose the, choose the former. Now you may be saying, well, I, I just read this passage with you. Nowhere does it actually say silently, so I don't know where you get the silent part, Pastor. That doesn't even make sense to me. Well, actually, in verse number one, it says, truly my soul waiteth. Now that word waiteth, and I'm not correcting the Bible, but this is what that word means. It means stillness, adverbally, silently, abstractly, quiet, or trust. Uh, it's... Um, the word is just, man, the drugs are not helping me tonight, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yes, I said drugs, but I mean like 
cough medicine that I'm taking for my brain for YouTube's sake. Uh, the synonyms, there's the words, would be silence, silent, and wait. So, so it's implied in the word, I'm quietly going to wait. I'm patiently and quietly and in silence going to wait. In fact, even most of the time when we tell somebody to wait, typically we're actually implying that they do so quietly. No, rather we mean it to your no, Some of y'all need to get with that. When I tell my kids, sit here and wait, whether I tell them to be quiet or not, I'm expecting, as you sit here and wait, just be quiet. <laughs> sit here and silence. <laughs> David says, verse number one, <laughs> again, excuse me, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. Let me ask you, when is the last time that you had an issue or something go on in your life and your reaction was, I'm just going to wait on God to fix it? Well, Pastor, I try to do that every time. No, I don't. I know. No, I try to as well. I, I've learned this in my, in my short time in ministry, and uh, I don't know, how long do you get to call it short? Because I've been in ministry like eight years. I don't know. I mean, is it a decade when it's no longer short? Because it feels like it's always going to be short because in perspective to other people, if Brother Dio's alive, my ministry is always going to be short. <laughs> you know, it's always going to be just a blip on a radar to some people's. Uh, but in my short ministry, I've learned this. When God handles a situation, especially one in the church, no, there's no residual damage. There's no, there's no outside damage. It's just whatever needed to get done gets done and nobody else is hurt. If I do it, Somebody else gets offended, somebody else gets hurt, somebody else gets... So I like to say, man, I'm waiting on the Lord, I, I'm waiting on the Lord, maybe you're here tonight, and it's a Wednesday night crowd, so most likely we'd say, yeah, pastor, I really try to wait on the Lord. But it's probably, if we're honest, we don't do it as often as we think we do. Because our pride, l listen, we, we think of pride in a lot of ways, but we forget pride is also the self-sufficiency to think that I have under control what I need to get under control in my life. And, and by the way, we've got, we've got people ranging from every age here today. And so let me, let me speak to the more senior citizens of the group that you may say, the longer you live in life, it's even easier to think that I've got it under control because you've seen more things. I know it's true as a 31-year-old. I remember the things that I used to call my dad and think, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. Now I don't call anybody because I've been there, done that kind of mentality seeps into your mind where you say, I've got this. I've got this under control. <coughs> I'm capable of handling it, handling it myself. And I handle problems at work, and I handle problems in my marriage, and I handle problems with my kids, and I handle problems with the grandkids. And I'm used to handling problems, Pastor. So what, if I'm good at handling it is, it, is it a big deal that I'm not always waiting on God to fix everything? Well, here's the only issue with it. A lot of times God does bring things into our life for two reasons. One, so He gets glory out of how it's handled. By the way, typically the way we handle it is not necessarily the way that God's going to get glory. And number two, so we grow in our dependency on Him. And so it's not necessarily bad that you're handling issues on your own, except that you're robbing God of the glory that He could have got the way He was going to handle it. And two, you haven't learned the dependency on God, which is something that He's always trying to get in us. I, I used this illustration before, but with, with my kids, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully going to raise them to be less and less dependent on Daddy and Mom. God never does that with us. That's the, that's, the weird, that's the weird dynamic where the, our Heavenly Father and we differ big time. Is God's never trying to raise us to be independent of Him. He's every day trying to teach us to be more and more dependent on Him. Now we've got to hurry here, so just bear with me as we fly through verses 2 through, or two through the end of the passage. He says, he, is, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. I mean, there's nothing. Listen, as we go through this, there's nothing that I'm going to teach you from this psalm that's mind-blowing. But what you will see is a man that is wholly reliant on God. He is his rock. That's his refuge. That's a place of safety. He is his salvation. He is his defense. He, he goes on now in verse number 3 is where we get to the people, that the issue. And we don't know what the issue was, but it's his brief uh, kind of saying what is going on. He says, how long will you imagine mischief against a man? We, he used the word imagine because here's the idea. It's all made up. The things that they're doing to me, that's not facts. And we know that it's backed up in the next verse because he mentions lies. So whatever David was facing as king, because he was in the excellency, so he was a king, and somebody brought some imaginations and some lies before the throne. By the way, that's a, that's a quick way for people to try to tear us down. Is, is If you do try to live a blameless life, which David did try to live. He was not perfect. He was not perfect. He was not perfect. He's just David. 
But he tried to live a life that was pleasing to the Lord. He's known as a man after God's own heart. And when you do that, the only thing that people can find against you then is to lie. No, if you're living blameless and above reproach, lies. And so he says, look, uh, they're, they're lying about me. And, and man, he, <laughs> he doesn't mince words with what's going to happen to him. He says, you shall be slain, all of you. He's, and then, as I already expressed as we were reading it, that, that term there, the bowing wall shall you be, and as a tottering fence, both those things are something you can look at and go, that's coming down soon. That's coming down soon. Man, if, a, if a wall's bowing real hard, you're going, that thing's going to fall. If a, if, a, if a fence is tottering, you're like, man, I hope we don't get a strong wind because that thing's going over. David's saying, you will be taken care of. In fact, he uses the word slain. He means killed. You're going to be taken care of by God, and it's coming soon. Then he goes on to say in verse number 4, that uh, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. The only reason they're all getting together and trying this out is they're really trying to get me from the position that God has put me in. By the way, let me encourage you, if God's put you in a position, it's real hard for somebody else to get you out of the position. What do you mean by that? I, I, I just mean exactly what I said. Uh, it, listen, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite sayings in, in college, and I think it's still true today and I still stand to it, is you don't have to be guilty, you only have to be accused. But the truth does come out. No, somebody can accuse me of something, but the truth is going to come out. If God wants you in a position, he's going to keep you there. And if God wanted David to be king, he knew he was, it, was, it was his job to keep him there. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. And oftentimes the people that are going to try to, that are going to, try to tear you down are the people that will smile to your face. They'll never be the people that will bring you to the side and express the issues they have with you, the problems they have, or discuss the things that they have. It's always the people that will look you in the eye and act like your best friends and then try to tear you down from the back. So after a little detail of what was happening, he, kind of, he encourages himself, really, in verses 5 and 6, similar to verse 1 and 2. He says, my soul, wait thou only upon God. So he's almost reminding himself, you've determined to wait on God? Keep doing it. <clears throat> Sometimes we need that reminder, don't we? Man, I'm waiting on, I'm going to wait on God, I'm going to wait on God, I'm going to wait on God. And it's like, no, 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 really, wait on God. <laughs> like, like, make a note, wait. Wait. Yeah. Well, pastor, I, I mean, I've waited... You know, God is, a, is an eternal God. He's an eternal being. He's not really bound by time. And so maybe for you, a few days feels like a long time of waiting. But for God, a few days may not be even the start of it. But sometimes, well, I've had this issue and I've had this issue for two months now. And God, I'm waiting on God to solve it and he hasn't yet. Well, to God, two, day, two months is nothing. Just wait. Well, okay, and, and here's really what we do. We, we need to be reminded to wait because here's really what we do. We look for open doors that God opened. Let me encourage you, not every open door is God's will. You know, God never closed any doors for me to go into the military. He didn't close those doors. Oh, they're still trying to recruit me. They're just waiting for me to sign the dotted line. I, I'd be in. That's it. You're like, it's that easy. Well, did, did God just slam that door shut? No! It stayed open. Well, why didn't you go? Because I knew that wasn't God's door. And, and listen, when we're, in those, when we're in those difficult times where we're trying to wait on the Lord, Satan sure does like to open doors too. Don't, don't listen to me. God is not the only one that has the power over, over this earth. Now, He has ultimate power, and he can, he can outdo anything Satan can do, but He does allow Satan to do His bidding here on earth. And Satan can open doors just as easy as God. Well, I'm going through this issue, and man, I really feel like God's just laid it all out for me and my wife to just get divorced. I mean, it just makes so much sense. Just because that's an open door don't mean it's God's option. Well, I, you know, this, this job, it's going to solve all of my financial problems. The only, the only catch is, I mean, I just got to work like 80 hours a week, and I can't come to church anymore, and I can't serve at church anymore, and I can't be involved in church, or I can't be involved with my kids, I can't really be involved with my family, but it's going to solve all my financial problems. Just because that's an open door doesn't mean it's the right door. Anyways, we've got to move on. None of this is like where I'm trying to get to. I have a point at the end that I promised you we were going to get to. <coughs> so, <coughs> my soul, wait, my soul, wait, on, wait thou only upon God. So he's encouraged us. Just keep waiting. For my expectation is from Him. Anything that I can expect good that's going to come out of this, it's going to have to come from God. Verse 6, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I can't even read that verse, brother. Are you with me? Just, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I don't know. I, I know we've talked about this. You read some of those passages and those songs just pop in. I don't, that may have been where they got it. I don't really know. But verse 7, 
Verse 7, in, in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. So again, one thing you're going to see through this psalm is that David really relied upon the Lord. We'll get to that in a, in a little bit, I suppose. Verse number 8, here's where now he encourages anybody that will read or listen to this later. Trust in him at all times, you people. Well, all times. I, I, I could sit here and preach on just this verse too. There's a lot of angles when, you, when you're preaching. There's only one interpretation, but many applications. All time is important. What do you mean all times? Like all times. When things are good, trust God. Well, that's the easy times though, isn't it? I was, I was expressing my gratitude uh, to Brother Nathan, and I plan on Sunday expressing my gratitude again to our church uh, for the very generous love offerings. It was very generous, very extremely beyond generous, beyond... I, had, I really didn't have any anticipation of anything uh, major, but it was major. And, and uh, Brother Nathan just said, you know, four years ago, we couldn't have done it. Well, the finances four years ago, we couldn't have done it. Those, those times when the finances, when I was sitting there with Brother Dave and Brother Nathan, and we're saying we can make one more payment to me as far as my, my payroll, and then we're, 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 that's basically it that we've got in the funds in 2020, and it was a little tight in the general. I remember that. Those are, that's all time, too, when you've got to trust God. It hasn't been the case in our missions yet, but then maybe there's a day where, where our faith promise missions is going to feel a lot more like faith when we're writing the checks. This is when you trust God in those times. All, I, this is all not planned. This is just God. But all time, all time. Okay, we're going to move on. Pour out your heart before Him. Remember what I said, dependency on Him is one of the goals of God bringing things into our life? Keep telling Him about it. Well, I mean, I already posted it on Facebook. So? I did a whole Instagram story on it, Pastor. God ain't reading your Instagram. Well, I mean, I, I talked to Him about it. When? Well, that one time. No, I, He phrased it very particularly. Pour out your heart. Before him, that's more. I don't know. I the way I read my Bible, that's more than just I talked about it after I prayed for my food that lunch day two days ago. I, I no, he's he's talking. About, I mean, give it to him. <clears throat> God is a refuge for us. Verse number nine. He here's some. I would say this is almost like uh, observations he has of people. So if you're if you're following the the kind of flow here of chapter sixty two or, or Psalm sixty two, I should say. It goes like this. Wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait on the Lord. These men are coming against me, but I'm choosing to wait on the Lord, and you learn dependency on the Lord. And then, here's some reasons why most people don't. Real quick, ready? verse number 9. Surely men of low degree are vanity. Men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. That All verse 9 is basically saying is it doesn't matter if you're a king or a beggar. It really doesn't matter. Your life at the end is all the same. No, it's all the same. You can weigh it in the balance. It's all together. It is the same vanity. You can't, it really does. Well, hey, I've got means to handle my problems. Your means don't mean nothing. No, you ask, the, you ask the billionaire that has paid every doctor in the world that he can find the best of the best to try to get him cured of the thing that's ailing him and he can't. Doesn't matter that he made billions. No, you can ask the most famous person in the world about their eternity, and they may have no idea about their eternity. In fact, that may be the thing that keeps them up at night. But they're the most famous person in the world. He's, basically, he, he's just letting us know, listen, who you are, no matter how many letters are after your name, no matter how, who knows you, that really doesn't matter. It's all the same. Verse number 11, uh, 10, that really, this shows us the other thing that people rely on. It's not just their prestige or who they are. It's their wealth. Trust not in oppression... And become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set, your, set not your heart upon them. You know the other thing that people think solves almost everything is money? Yeah. Uh, real quick, I don't know. Money solves everything. Man, money solves everything, Pat. I, I, and many people think that most of their problems would be gone if they had money. We preached about it in Ecclesiastes. More money, more problems. In fact, I think I titled the message, More Money, More Problems, yeah. when I preached it in Ecclesiastes. That's just the way it is. <clears throat> Verse number 11 and 12, here's kind of the conclusion of it. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. It's really all in his hands anyway. Mm -hmm. No, ultimately he can sit there and wait on God. He can be quiet and wait in silence on God because he's like, all the power is his anyway. 
Verse number 12. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Remember, in the context, somebody else is attacking him with lies and things that aren't true, trying to take him out of the king, uh, out of, off his throne, because, and he's saying, I know that mercy belongs to you, and you're going to render every man according to his work. You're going to give them what they deserve for lying, and you're going to give me what I deserve for just doing right and doing what I'm told to. So there's the passage, and I was just sharing with Brother Nathan, I was talking to him about Acts on Sunday morning, the book of Acts, and I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, so what is a question we ask once we understand a passage, we ask ourselves, so what? Well, basically what that means is, what does this matter for us? So what? You read that, and uh, I hope this helps you maybe just to remind you to depend on the Lord or something like that. But <clears throat> I do have a so what here. Here's the application. We're, we're almost done. Back to the beginning. I said the problem with constant noise in our life is we rob ourselves of the opportunity to silently wait on God. And in most circumstances in life, we can silently wait on God, patiently, silently waiting on God, or we can let all of our emotions and feelings and, and even negative actions run free. So what I want to show you what you're missing out on from this passage when life is too noisy. I'm going to show you real quick, just four, real quick, what you're missing out on when life is too noisy. Number one, when life is too noisy, we miss out on the still small voice of God. I don't believe God is going to yell at you <laughs> when you're going through hard times to get you to trust him. You know, it's never happened to me when I've gone through hard times where God's like, Stephen, I'm talking to you, man. What does he do? Well, I think he does exactly what he does with, did with David as David sat there. He said, hey, I got you. I'm your rock. I'll handle this. In fact, I, I'm guessing it was in the quiet that he heard what was said in verse 11 that power belongeth unto God. When did he hear that? When did he get that? I'm guessing it was the still small voice of God that let him know. We've got to hurry. Number two, when life gets too noisy, we miss out on opportunities to meditate. God intends for comfort to come through times of meditation. In fact, that's why the Bible constantly tells us to meditate on the Word of God. It's supposed to give us confidence. It's supposed to give us comfort. There's a lot of things that come. <clears throat> you know when you can't meditate? When everything else is going on. Well, we just talked about it in Sunday school. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but we talked about getting a, a alone, quiet. Why? Because that's, that's the only place you can really meditate. When life's real busy, you don't get to meditate on the things of God. David, in the time of silence, was able to meditate on God. And listen, as you read through this psalm, you can read it again now just looking for the attributes of God, and you'll find some amazing attributes of God, like His mercy, like His power, like His strength like his faithfulness, the fact that he's the rock, his salvation, his deliverance. He, you'll read all those. Where did he come up with all those attributes of God? He sat there and meditated on the God that he served in the silence and in the quiet and in the waiting. Number three, when life is too noisy, we miss out on godly perspective of life. Here's what I mean by that. In the moment, whatever trial we're going through usually seems pretty big, typically bigger than we can even handle sometimes. That's human perspective. No, that's human perspective. That's just natural. You walk out of the doctor's office and the news you get feels huge. You walk out or you, you get the call from your family member and the news they got feels huge. This one lost their job and this one uh, has this sickness and, and this family member's having a hard time here and this family member does. And you go, man, this, it, it feels huge. That's human perspective. How did David get the perspective that God would take care of his situation? <laughs> and also what he even says in verse number 9, that life is all vanity without God anyway. Well, it's simple. He got it from God. He sat there and waited from God, and it helped him to get a godly perspective on the whole situation. You know what gives me a lot of peace about pastoring? Because I, I make mistakes, and there's times I don't feel like I know what I'm doing, and, and, and there's, sometimes it feels overwhelming. You know what I remind myself? God's the one that put me in the position. That's, that's godly perspective over human perspective. When my, when my kids feel overwhelming, parenting four of them, I remind myself that, that God is the giver of life. No, He gave them to me. So He can get my wife and I through it. 
even when all six of us are coughing and hacking and feel like we're going to die. <laughs> Snotty. It's not alicious. <laughs> he sat and waited on God and it gave him a godly perspective about the whole situation. All of a sudden he's looking at him going, you're like a bowing wall and a tottering fence. You're coming down. It's coming soon. Last one here. When life is noisy, too noisy, you miss God's solution. Whenever things happen in our lives, it's amazing how many other people have an opinion on what you should do in that situation. In fact, I actually typically would tell people I'd discourage them from posting on social media or asking everybody and their mother about what they should do every time something comes up in their life. Because here's the reality. 99% of the time, unless you're going to like a spiritual leader and somebody that uses the Bible as their foundation, you're going to get the wrong answer. <clears throat> Your coworkers are going to tell you to get divorced. That's the easy way out. Your, your, listen, your family member may tell you that they'll tell you what is easy. The noise of everyone around us causes us to miss the real solution, which usually comes from God. And it's usually pretty simple. It's, he's the refuge. He's the rock. Now, that's the solution to everything, simply. But look in verse number 8 again. He says, trust in him at all times, you people. <laughs> Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Well, I don't, He hasn't given me the solution yet. No, no, sometimes it doesn't come when you think it should. I, trust me, God does not work how Stephen Jones wants Him to work most of the time. I get kind of frustrated about it some, occasionally when I'm in the flesh. I'm like, this is not how it's supposed to work out. But the solution comes. His solution. But you've got to get it quiet. Got to get alone. Got to wait. <clears throat> life is stressful. Life is full of problems, and you will always be overwhelmed and stressed if you don't learn how to silently wait on God. <clears throat> I'm going to share a quick story, and then we're done. Ready? Elijah Hoffman, he was a pastor in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. There was a lady at his church that seemed to have troubles and trials all the time. We all know the type. <laughs> he went by to see her one day to have prayer with her and found out a new calamity had befallen her. As she unburdened her heart to her pastor, telling him of what happened, she would wring her hands and say, Oh, Brother Hoffman, what shall I do? What shall I do? When she finished telling him what had happened, Pastor Hoffman opened the Bible and began to read to her verses of assurance, trust, and the faithfulness of God. After, she read the scripture, after he read the Scripture to her, he said, You see, my dear sister, God wants to bear all your, these sorrows, whether great or small. The best thing we can do is take them to Jesus. We must tell Jesus. For a moment, there was a silence, and then, with a face of glow, she exclaimed, Yes, Pastor, you're so right. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. He went back to his church study and wrote the words to this song. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Amen. Tell Jesus, learn to sit and wait quietly after you do. He has a solution. He knows what he's doing. So next time you run into the hardship, just tell Jesus and then wait. But quietly. Shh. He's got the solution. Don't let the noise of the world distract you from his solution. Let's pray.